lot of factors that led to the Chinese Exclusion Act was the competition for labor. And the North Adams strike and strike breaking was evidence that if you let the Chinese in, they would have taken your jobs away. So the labor unions all turned against the Chinese, supported the Chinese Exclusion Act, and that was passed in 1882. Now, there were already many Chinese in the U.S. at that point that come from the work on the railroad, work on the mines, and there was also ethnic cleansing. So as the European settlers into the West Coast, they threw people out. So Tacoma, Washington, where a Chinese community had grown up from the railroad workers who had worked on the Northern Pacific Railroad, were told to leave at a certain date in their posters saying the Chinese must go. And run by the mayor, who was a German immigrant. Most of the Chinese left before the deadline. Seattle threw people out, but then they took them back in. Rock Springs Massacre. Los Angeles lynched the Chinese. So people started going east. As Boston, New England, New York, Chicago began to industrialize, the Chinese came across on the railroad. This population really shifted to the Northeast. So when they arrived in a place like Boston, the first laundries recorded in 1875. And then it grew very rapidly because more and more people came from the West Coast. The Exclusion Act has only three exempt categories. Diplomats, students, and merchants. Otherwise, no Chinese were admitted to the U.S. Any Chinese who were in the U.S. could not be naturalized. So the intent was clear that in 20, 30, 40 years, you would have no Chinese. The society at that point were all men. And even if they had families back in China, they lived in America as bachelors. So one of the terms we used at that period was the bachelor society. Many immigrants at that point, including the Chinese, were so-called sojourners. That is, their intention was to make money and go back to China. That's no problem. But then there were people who really wanted to settle into the U.S., and the Exclusion Act made that very, very difficult. The original way you could fake a student visa, you could be a merchant, the merchants is interesting because merchants, you had to establish that I had to be extremely vetted. You had to prove you actually ran a business and so on. In that case, you could travel back and forth to China. You could bring your family over, but you couldn't get naturalized. That led to what's now called anchor babies. The richer merchants would have their families here and they were free to go back and forth. A lot of the rise of restaurants came about because you had to have a legitimate business and they would rotate the partners. So they would take turns being the partners so they were able to become merchant status. The other way was false birthright claims. Birthright is the 14th Amendment 14th Amendment was necessary because the U.S. Constitution said that no person of color could be naturalized. So after slavery ended, black folks had no status. So the 14th Amendment was passed that said anyone who was born in the United States is a citizen. The other piece of the birthright is derivative citizenship. That is, any children born to a U.S. citizen can claim citizenship if they come to the U.S. before age 21. Now that is the basis for the fact that we have any Chinese in America at all. For Boston and New England, and pretty much the Northeast, the preferred route was through Canada and the northern border. Angel Island was seen as much, much more difficult. 
1906 earthquake destroyed all the birth records in San Francisco. So most of the Chinese in San Francisco at that time went to the courts and claimed that they should be issued a new birth certificate because their old birth certificate was destroyed in the earthquake. Statistically, it was impossible because there were so few women there. But again, the courts had to prove he wasn't. So that was the basis for most of the families coming to the U.S. Between the northern border and the San Francisco, families began to form.